Hello everyone and welcome to today's video. So now we're going to be going into part two of chapter two, where in this chapter we're going to be going over the eukaryotic cell cycle. So we're going to be talking about the cell cycle itself and then also how the cell divides via mitosis. All right, let's hop into it. So first here, the, the cycle itself, we draw it like a clock. It has these different phases in it, interphase, and it has a gap one synthesis, gap two, and then the mitotic phase, which is broken into mitosis and cytokinesis. So let's draw it out and go through each of these steps. So let's imagine we're a cell coming out here, just finished its last round of uh, mitosis and it's just divided. So we have a fresh cell going out this way, and then we have a cell going this way. Let's follow this next cell here through its life. Um, the first phase it enters here, again, we, it's like going, going around a clock. Uh, this is the G1 phase. So this is where the cell grows. So it needs to grow, you know, get larger, anything like that after it freshly divides. So that's called G1. Now it can enter a state here after it does grow into an undividing state. That's called G0 or G0. It stays there. So like things like neurons are in this undividing state, but they're still working. Um, at this part here, there's also a checkpoint. This is called the G1 slash S checkpoint. We'll go over these checkpoints a little later in the semester for what gives them the go ahead, the stop and go signal. Think of these as like green lights. Typically there are enzymes involved and things like that, but there's an important checkpoint right there. Now we go into the next phase. So once it gets this G1 S checkpoint, it then replicates the DNA. So then it goes through the S phase. So let's, let's draw a center here so we can start drawing our little pie charts for the phases. So S here, this is where the DNA replicates or DNA synthesis. So if a cell gets that G1S checkpoint to go ahead, it's going to go through cell division because once it replicates all the DNA, so remember we have, you know, one sister chromatid and then it replicates and makes the other sister chromatid on the other side. You have a lot of DNA in the nucleus then, and you can't really go through much, you know, gene expression and cell division at that point. So that, you know, we have our, our DNA. Next, it, after that's finished, it then goes into what's called G2. G2 is where it's just uh, continually to get ready for mitosis. Uh, so there's a checkpoint in here called the G2 slash M checkpoint. So gap two, it just prepares for division. So as we're preparing for division, you know, certain protein machinery and things like that are getting ready. Um, next, we go through M. You know, this is a bad looking clock here, but the mitotic phase, that's M. So it's broken into uh, mitosis and cytokinesis. I'm not going to draw cytokinesis. It's just the event of um, division of cytoplasm. So these are just mainly definitions here. Mitosis is division of nucleus. And cytokinesis is a division of cytoplasm. So it's just the moment the cytoplasm splits from one cell to the other. There's also an important checkpoint in here we'll talk about later today called the M checkpoint. Sometimes this is also called the spindle assembly checkpoint. So let's talk a little bit more what I mean when I say spindle. So in a cell, we have the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is made of three filaments. Uh, there are actin filaments, which are the microfilaments or intermediate filaments. And then there are the microtubules. Um, so the microtubules are the larger filaments and the microtubules help the cell hold things in place, allow tracks for vesicles to walk along, but also they assist the cell in cell division. So they're produced by centrioles. So I wanna go over a little bit about what the mitotic spindle is and how it's organized. So a, um, a centriole, usually they're duplicates, so we we'll draw two centrioles here. And then, so this is called a centrosome. Centrosome is just two centrioles. It's a microtubule organizing center. Um, so here, a pair of centrioles. So these produce microtubules. Um, microtubules are these spindle fibers. So they spindle fibers or microtubules release from these centrioles or the centrosome complex. Um, so down here then we have the spindle fibers. Now, I just want to talk about these spindle fibers a little bit. So here they're made of, again, microtubules. Because understanding these is important for understanding the cell division process, because these are what help direct the chromosomes in cell division. Here, we'll just label these MTs. There are different types of microtubules. So if I draw a cell down here, 
and let's draw just you know one chromosome lined up in the middle here and then so what happens is these centrosomes move to the ends uh, there's they create a pair they duplicate they move to the ends uh, this is this defines a certain phase of the cell cycle. So here we have some microtubules or spindle fibers that come out and connect to the kinetochore at the centromeres of the chromosome. So one attaching on each end, think of them pulling each other. And this is what helps direct them to the middle of the cell. Some of these fin uh, microtubule spindle fibers can cross over each other. Now think about crossing over each other and think about two fibers on each other. When you put that pressure down, you're elbows push out so that helps the cell elongate and pushes the cell outwards there are also some that come out the back here so these are called asters and they reach out to grab the back of the membrane these ones are called non kinetochore microtubules mts and then these ones are called uh, kinetochore microtubules i won't write that one down so three different types of microtubules we found here we find here at the spindle fibers um, now here microtubules can also lengthen and shorten where they have to grow out in a way to reach out so they start here at the organizing center and then reach out and find a centromere sometimes they don't so they have to grow they have to lengthen and shorten uh, so these microtubules are made up of these tubulin subunits that then wrap around and form this hollow tube so here imagine a hollow tube like this and it's just they reach out and they're filled with these subunits so these subunits fall off and on at a positive end and a negative end. Uh, later on, we're gonna talk about this Pac-Man method. So the positive end is the end that comes out here and grabs the centromere. So the tubulin subunits actually fall off that end as it looks like they're reeling the chromosomes back in. Okay, so now let's go through mitosis. So mitosis is all, you know, again, division of the nucleus. So it's broken into certain stages. Um, when I first learned this in AP Bio way back in the day, we learned PMAT. The PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. But now we include another phase in here, so it's more like PPMAT. So prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So whatever ways you want to use to remember the different stages of mitosis is up to you. Um, but here, the first stage is prophase. Uh, prophase is when chromosomes condense and the spindle form. So if we're looking at a cell here, I'll draw this cell as we go through here, uh, we still have a nuclear envelope, some fragments of one, and then the chromosomes are beginning to condense in the middle. So you can see spots appearing. Uh, now, if we're looking at the centrosomes, there might be a pair, but they're not yet at the poles. And that's why we have this other phase now called prometaphase. Prometaphase is when there's no more nucleus, so no more nucleus. Um, we have the centrosomes at the ends, and then we have the chromosomes spread out sporadically, not yet lined up in the middle. Now, when they do line up in the middle, so when they go through the next stage here, and now we have our chromosomes lined up at the middle with you know the spindle fibers attached to them, that is metaphase. So metaphase for middle. So this is where we get to that spindle assembly checkpoint, which is a very, very important checkpoint. Imagine if this one wasn't attached right there. So only this side was attached. Remember there are two, two sister chromatids on each of these little dashes right here. If this one never attached and this went into anaphase where they go away from each other, you'd have an unequal number of chromosomes in the daughter cells. That's called a non-disjunction disorder. And we'll be talking about that in a future chapter. So the spindle assembly checkpoint makes sure, uh, well, ensures everything is connected. So if we draw you know, a larger chromosome here, do you want a microtubule attached at each kinetochore? If that doesn't happen, it won't pass this checkpoint. Another thing that happens here is up until this point, these sister chromatids are held together by a protein. Think of it as like a rubber band. These are called cohesins. So an enzyme is also involved at this state, stage to cleave the cohesins and separate them so the sister chromatids can be pulled away from each other. That enzyme that comes in and does that separation and cleaving is called separase. So whenever you see ACE, think enzyme. So separase cleaves cohesins and then brings them apart. We'll come back to this again next chapter uh, when we talk about the, some different stages of meiosis and these cohesins and separates become important again. All right, 
So now, next phase here, they will pull away from each other. This is called anaphase. This is the you know easiest one to spot on a microscope if you're looking at it. So you have the spindle coming out, and they're pulling the chromosomes away, and they look like little birds almost. So they're pulling them towards the opposite sides or opposite poles of the cell. So now we have the chromosomes over there. They arrive at the ends, and then the nuclear envelope begins to reform again, and then we start splitting the cell into two new cells. So this is the end phase or telophase, just like telomere was the ends of the chromosomes. Telophase is the end of cell division. So the arrive at the poles, decondense, so they begin falling apart again. Well, not falling apart, but like, you know, gene expression and so forth starts beginning again. And then a nuclear envelope begins reforming. I won't draw that one out, though. And then cytokinesis is just the event of division of the cytoplasm. So this is slightly different in plants and animals. So cytokinesis in animal cells forms something called a cleavage furrow. So if these were two cells dividing, we have, you know, the nuclear envelope reforming over here, the chromosomes decondensing in the middle. So here would be the other one, chromosomes in the middle. This little cleavage furrow forms in the middle. So what this is, remember before I talked about the different types of cytoskeletal filaments, I mentioned the microfilaments. Uh, this is actually a ring of actin. Think about, you know, having, you know, a ball of, you know, silly putty and you put two bread ties around it and start twisting the bread tie ends together. That's kind of what this actin does. Eventually, you're going to pip, you know, it's going to you know pull off two different pieces of silly putty. Um, and that's what this action is. It slowly pinches this until the two cells just boom, pop off. Now, cytokinesis is slightly different in plant cells. So if we draw the generic, you know, cell wall of a plant cell and we have the two new cells with the nucleus forming with the DNA in it. What happens here is each of these cells begins producing vesicles, which then bud off the Golgi apparatus and start fusing in the middle, and that's called a cell plate. Because if you tried to pinch this with a ring of actin, it wouldn't work. You know, um, actin is too weak to pinch the cell wall apart. So it forms a new cell wall here called a cell plate. So I just want to talk about some slight differences between plants and animals. And now an important thing we want to do throughout all of this, so let's track chromosomes through the cell cycle. Uh, after we talk about metaphase, uh, not metaphase, meiosis next video, I'll also produce a um, example problem video where we just, you know, look at random stages in, of a random example and see if we can calculate the number of chromato chromosomes and sister chromatids at any part of the division cycle. Uh, so here, just tracking chromosomes, just you know, a brief representation here of what we just talked about. So if we're just looking at one chromosome here, and that's the nucleus, here we're in G1. We go through DNA replication, which is S phase, and then we go into G2. So here, if we draw that one again, we have that chromosome replicated itself now. Does a nuclear envelope, so there's G2. So this is all interphase right here. And then we go through mitosis, produce two new daughter cells, and then we go back to G1. So let's look at this in terms of like an example for chromosome number. Um, so here we're looking at a human somatic cell. So how many chromosomes does a human have? 46. So we're looking at G1 here. So we're using this as a reference right here. So G1, we're, we're comparing the number of chromosomes per cell and the number of DNA molecules per cell. So in G1, of course, we have 46 chromosomes. We also have 46 DNA molecules. You can think of these as chromatids as well. So we haven't gone through DNA replication yet. Then we go through S phase. So here, I think towards the end of S phase, we would have 46 chromosomes still, because remember, this is still considered a chromosome. And then the number of DNA molecules, let's assume we're at the towards the end of S phase, this would actually double then to 92 sister chromatids because we're going from you know this to the duplicate adding another sister chromatid down each side. So that would be then the same in G2, we'd have 46 and 92. Now let's imagine we're at you know, prophase and prometaphase. That's when they're working on lining up towards the middle up here. It's you know, still the same. Uh, we still have 46 chromosomes and 92. Same at metaphase where they line up at the middle, 46 and 92. Now anaphase, remember, is when these each separate from each other going opposite directions. I know I draw them up and down from each other, but imagine I'm going left and right. So now this has this one chromosome has split into two chromosomes temporarily, and it's still two sister chromatids. So 
for a temporary amount of time, there are 92 chromosomes in the cell and still 92 of these. These then finally split into two new cells and then we drop back to 46 for each. So being able to track the chromosomes through the cells uh, and being able to write these numbers in will help you understand the different phases. And then when we add meiosis into this next, you'll definitely know if you understand it or not. So the functions of mitosis, you know, you start as a fertilized cell and you grow. Uh, so growth and development is via mitosis. The growth and development. Next here, uh, asexual reproduction. We talked about that with binary fission. So asexual reproduction uses mitosis. And then, um, so those are the, the two main uh, functions we have in mitosis. So mainly, I mean, growth and development is quite important. You start as one cell and we become as many cells as we are today. So now uh, there are some different cell types we find in uh, multicellular eukaryotes. And this also starts leading us into the next chapter. So all the cells in the body, so, you know, one through, well, chromosomes one through 22 or pairs, those are called somatic cells for humans, that is. So regular body cells, uh, 2N in animals, plants, and some protists. Uh, so here, 2N is equal to 46, of course, in humans. And then the other types of cells are the reproductive cells. So these ones are called germ cells. So these are the sperm and egg cells for humans, uh, spores in plants. So here, uh, these are called gametes, so the sperm and ova and animals. Uh, and then here, spores and plants, fungi, and some protists. Uh, we're going to be focused on the gametes next chapter. So in human uh, gametes, N is the is one. We have you know one set of gametes. Um, so, oh, I wrote this wrong. So this would be two N. Oh, oh. So these ones here. Sorry, sorry. I was getting ahead of myself. I was thinking differently. So in humans, two N is just the diploid number of the final chromosome, which is 46. And here in human gametes, in the gamete itself, not the actual, you know, sex chromosomes, we have um, 23, of course, which is the haploid number. All right. So yeah, sorry, got a little tongue tied there at the end. I was thinking ahead too far um, between sex cells and uh, somatic cells, but, or autosomes. And then here, so we have that. And now next chapter, we're going to be going into meiosis or sexual reproduction and forming these gametes. How do we go from a cell with 46 to a cell with 23? So we just talked about mitosis and how that works here. So if we have a cell like this, how do we cue that to go through what's called meiosis and produce a cell with half the number of chromosomes? Also, the most important part about meiosis is that the cells are then genetically different from each other. Here, mitosis, we are 100% genetically similar. The next one we're going to be talking about uh, meiosis and how we form genetically different daughter cells. But that's all I have for the eukary eukaryotic cell cycle. Hope you learned a little bit today. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.